Sunday Floss Tube, it's Arlene. I'm back, it's my second video. Uh, and I can't tell you how wonderful uh, it's been <laughs> to have created my first video and the um, wonderful reaction I've gotten. I know when I did that, uh, so today is Saturday, April 8th, and it was about two weeks ago. I think it was on a Monday that I ended up recording that, although it might not have gotten posted till Tuesday, and that was some of my struggles. But I know when I did it, one of the beginning things, I was sort of like, I don't know who's going to find this. And I've been learning more and more than lots of you did. So if you watched my first video and you're coming back because you got, you subscribed and you're coming back because you saw I made a second one, thank you so much. And if you're finding this one first uh, because you found it, as I'm learning more and more about floss tube, you just, people just find one another. Um, it's really cool to be a part of a community like this and I just can't say that enough I just so loved all the comments I replied to all of them so if you're someone who left a comment I hope you saw responses I wrote back um, if you are someone who makes floss tube videos I know some people just watch them and if you're someone who makes floss tube videos and didn't tell me that you make floss tube videos please leave a comment let me know that you do I would love to go and watch you too I don't know if there's some way that a person is supposed to know or supposed to figure this out or supposed to go and check. Um, haven't figured this all out, but I'm working on it. Uh, <laughs> that last time I struggled for quite some time getting that video uploaded and figuring it all out. I so desperately wanted uh, a book, YouTube for Dummies, in my hand. Um, and I looked it up. There actually is a book, uh, but it was a copyright of 2007. I know all the information would be outdated. There's a new version of 2015, but even that might not be accurate. Um, but luckily found a few people on Facebook that gave me some helpful answers. So I'm still a novice in all of this. But there's a few things that if you are watching this now and could help me with, it would be awesome. So the first thing that I would love to figure out is so many of you floss tubers who make videos have a name other than your first and last name. And I could not figure out how to do that. And I don't know if that has to do with YouTube channels and it's something that you have a channel just for your floss tube, but even that, I don't get that. If anyone could give me like YouTube for dummy kind of instructions, on how I could change my name for floss tube videos such that it just shows a different name other than my first and last name. Um, I want to call this works by ABC. My initials are ABC. Um, my middle name is Beth. It's not Elizabeth, it's Beth. So my initials truly are ABC. And when I do, when I put my initials on things, I put ABC, although usually in the last recent years, I put initials in places where it's like under a mat for framing. I don't necessarily have it shown, although older pieces it does show. Anyway, if anyone in comments could leave the instructions on how to do that, that would be awesome. The other thing I would love to figure out, so many of you do great things like wanting to link or people you've mentioned in floss tubes or wanting to share links, you always say, I'll put it below in the comments or you'll put it below. And it, I figured out how to see those. You got to take the little arrow and click it. Um, but in the last two video, YouTube video, when I was uploading it, I couldn't figure out how you add those notes. Um, I'm doing this on a Saturday on a weekend, so I have time, more time to play around with it. If you're watching this video and I have not succeeded in finding how to add those notes, I have a few things like some website links that I would love to share with you. Um, I don't know if anyone's interested in going to them, but I would love to share them with you. Um, if you, if I have not succeeded in figuring out how to put them there, if anyone could leave me some instructions in the comments on how to do it, that'd be awesome. And it's just the way that I've seen so much helpful kindness in this group. Um, it's a way you could, I would, it would be kind to me. Um, and my way of paying it forward, I'll share a little bit of kindness with you. If you are like me and relatively new to floss tube and watching videos just as they've been popping up and I don't know if you click on one and then YouTube kind of leads you to somebody that's related to that person based on their subscribers and so on. I found a number of people mentioning Stitch Mania on Facebook and I'm on Facebook um, as myself. I barely post in my own account, but within groups of both my needlework world and a whole nother world. 
Um, and so I'd gone searching for the Stitch Mania group. People mentioned it. It was a good group. And I couldn't find it. And then thank you to the first person who mentioned in my comments about that group because they had to spell it out. And I learned that Stitch Mania is spelled M-A-Y-N-I-A. -A. Um, the group was first formed based on a, a challenge or something that was going on in the month of May. And that's why the group originally got named Stitch Mania like that. It was expanded beyond things going on in the month of May. But if you are someone who have heard people mentioning Stitch Mania on Facebook in FlossTube videos and have wanted to join that group and have not been able to find it on FlossTube, excuse me, on Facebook, maybe it's because you didn't know correct spelling like me, and maybe now I've helped you figure it out. So that's my little paying it forward for the moment. Um, so I'm going to jump in with some stitching sharing and just go forward down my little list here. I'm going to start with the piece that I finished, um, which shouldn't have been a surprise. I was so close to finishing it from the last time. So this is, well, its original name is Ruby Razzle Dazzle. Uh, it doesn't have any red threads. <laughs> the original design looks like this. Its designer is Anne Streit Kurtz. Um, and so like this, for example, is one thing I would love to like put a link to her website. If you have never done anything in the counted canvas world, or you've just like never seen stuff like this before, and you're just curious, I'm not saying you're going to go out and do a, a large project like this, or even you're ever going to do anything like this, but you're just kind of curious. I, I know I have followed, um, in different folks floss tube videos, links and stuff just out of curiosity. So if you are interested just to see some of her designs, you could look her up by name. And Stripes. And Stripe Kurtz. Google her. Get her website. Um, I changed all the colors. This is a close-up. So you could sort of see a close-up of her original. Where's mine? It's on 18 count canvas. And man, you can see my bookshelves through there. But there you go. So I finished that. Like I said, it was really about one or two nights worth of stitching after the last time you saw it. So it was, it was like a basically done kind of thing when I was filming that last video. Um, and I had a couple of people who asked about the color changes and, um, I know many of you do color changes in, in cross-stitch designs and whether you go from DMC to um, variegated and over dyes or vice versa and how different is that with a design like this and uh, basically in the instruction book that this came with she gave some I think this design was originally a class so there were some instructions I think she had originally given some options for different colorways basically the design start or the the idea of changing colors starts with picking a Karen water Karen watercolors, which is um, how thick would I refer this to? It comes like this, but then you it, I bought two of them. I only needed one, so you could see this is a brand new one. You would use one of three strands. And one of three strands is probably equivalent to about a pearl cotton five. So it's it's fairly thick from a cross stitch standpoint, I think you would say. Um, so I had found a watercolors that I just really liked. It was uh, um, lots of blues involved. They called it cornflower blue. And from there, picked out assorted, uh, associated other threads, including a pearl cotton and um, other blues that went with it. And, uh, oh, and also uh, some Krynic threads that can, that weren't matching it, but hmm, colors aren't showing up really great. This is a blue. And this is definitely a more of a lavender. Uh, and then the secondary color, which I hadn't picked originally. I had picked, I got the kind of the blue family and I couldn't really decide what I want to do for a secondary color for it. And what I did is I brought all those blue threads to the store where I was going to pick out a canvas. And I mentioned Needleworkers Delight in the past. They are um, relatively my local needlework store and they also have all their uh, 
the distributor for Zweigart. So they have all the canvases you can imagine. Plus they do over dyes. They do dyeing themselves through their name of Silk Weaver's Delight. If I say it correctly. Um, anyway, I brought the blue threads to their store and I picked out the, the this is kind of like a, like a modeled, it's not solid. It's not crazily over dyed. It's just sort of a, it's a really neat texture to it. And then in trying to decide the secondary color, I ended up with just a brownish tan color, um, like a light brown. And I'll come back to that because that's related to another piece I'm going to show you. But I wanted to comment about Kynic Threads, um, another little public service announcement, a little help um, paying it forward in the world. I once did a project using, well, I know I originally used, first encountered Krynik, probably with a cross stitch, probably with some blending filament, maybe using the one of the lighter braids. I imagine many of you have used these guys before. And then the first time I used a lot of them, I had a project that I used something like 18 of these, a lot of number four braid. Uh, that's... Uh, hanging in a place of honor in a friend's home, so it's not thing, something I'm ever going to show you in Foss tube. But after I used all those scroll, um, things of it, <laughs> I it was much, much later that I learned something about these Krynik spools. And so I want to share with you, if you don't know this, but the top and the bottom but they, they move up. You, you kind of need a nail. You can stick the edge of a scissor or, th or a needle in there. Kind of pops up a little bit and you can unwind it. And that's how you can start the thread. And that's how you could like store it so it doesn't, you know, unravel at you. You can like stick it in there like this. And then, you know, with a little push, it'll stay. And I, can you see this? I think you can. I did not know that the tops of Krynix are made to do that. It actually works on both ends. And again, you need like either a nail or something to just kind of separate it enough to get the thread out when you're starting or to keep it for storage. And every so often there are times where I'm, I'm with someone and they've got Krynix out and they've, they know that trick. And then there are times where people are like, I never knew that before. So if I've taught you something super cool, pass on that information to someone else. That's the pass, pay, pay it forward in the world. That's what I like to do. Um, cool. The next thing to share is the update of the project that I put aside because I was finishing up the Ruby Razzle Dazzle. And that is this lacy tablecloth. Um, so this came from this New Stitches magazine which is uh, from the UK. It's an old magazine purchased at Needleworkers Delight. They have a whole bunch of old magazines. Very conveniently, this is in the center. <laughs> the center thing came out, so that's convenient. This is the piece, it's done on blue, which of course makes it stand out beautifully. And um, this tablecloth with the center part of it being 14 count Ada only exists nowadays in certain colors. So this is a gray. Um, and I like, I like it. I, the white stands out enough. I wish it stood out a little bit more, but it stands out enough. The parts that are, that are cross-stitched are with three strands of DMC floss. And then there's lots of, you can see here, there's some one-stranded cross-stitch and a little bit of like um, back-stitching as well. So it's uh, coming along. This is actually the first project I have ever used Q-snaps for. I have always been a roller bar person for like cross stitch and linen projects and I have been a stretcher bar project for canvas work. Um, I've never had, I've never gone to the Q-snaps. This, given the tablecloth part that's on the outside edge, this was my opportunity to try Q-snaps. So there you go. So I am going to continue down my um, list of sharing all the various projects I've done. You know, it's funny. I started to write out projects that I could share on Floss Tube um, because I am not, I'm a one project at a time kind of person. And so that tablecloth is what I'm currently working on. And I just kind of asked myself, well, 
eventually I'm going to run out of projects to share and how much can I do floss tube videos by here's how far I got with my tablecloth and when I'm done with that you know there wouldn't be much to share so I wrote down a list and at first whoa, my iPad's moving here and at first I think we're good at first that list didn't seem that long it was basically the things that hang on my wall and walls around my home and then a few other things that are sort of out um, and I'm like gosh this this will be a few floss tube videos but I don't know how long and then I just kept that list of that piece of paper out and I started to add to it and realized oh this is there and that's there and I forgot about this and there's a lot of things on that list so I'm looking forward to sharing lots of things with you all um, but a little bit each video. So last time I shared with you the story of what I call my first cross stitch, the baby, or known as um, the little girl having a tea party. And, and the project is called Tea Party. And it came from an old issue of uh, Cross Stitch and Country Crafts. And somebody had commented about the companion piece. And my first response was, there's a companion piece? And it has a name called the Little Aviator, and I was able to Google Little Aviator Cross Stitch and Country Crafts, and gotta love the internet, boom, it popped up. You can find them on eBay. And when I saw it, it was like an immediate flashback. I knew that there, you know, I, of course, I hadn't thought about it in the longest time. Somehow, I don't, I don't know how, I, in some vague, somehow, in the, needlework store and the cross stitch store that existed near my home growing up where I purchased what I'm going to show you in a minute a couple of other issues of cross stitch and country crafts I must have somehow encountered either the tea party pattern or something else or encountered that other one and it said it was a companion piece somehow in my mind I knew that because when I immediately saw the picture of this little boy and it's called the little aviator and he's playing with his planes and trains I immediately recognized it and I immediately know why it didn't appeal to me at the time um, and again if I could figure out how to give links I'll link you to you know somebody selling it on eBay uh, there's a bunch of them out there it's not that hard to, to find a picture of it um, it the, the boy is like in the sailor suit and it's very like turn of the century 1900 little boy sailor suit his legs are all white or nearly white that like a uh, like white stockings of that time period that little boys would wear his hair it almost looks like a little girl like his hair is too long it just so didn't appeal to me at all I get it you know his blue like I bet the blues are the same DMC color as the little girl's blue so I guess that's why it's called a companion piece but no never did it occur to me of ever making that so this is what did appeal to me. So going to that little needlework store, which I can vaguely picture of where it was in my hometown. Um, I look, no, I didn't get, I got this at the craft basket. That's the store in Brookfield, Connecticut. Huh, man, I'm confusing the story in my mind. So, hmm, maybe it was in the craft basket that I saw that, ma anyway. I saw this magazine, I saw this cover, probably went right around the time I finished my um, little girl, based on the date of this magazine, and I thought, yeah, I'm going to do her. It's got the same, and you can question whether that's a boy or a girl. I have always decided it's a girl. You can make it a boy with long hair, it's a girl to me. But the same kind of detail, the same kind of amazement of, wow you start with a blank cloth and you you make that and and here she is and she is hung on the walls of all the various places I've lived she's she came to me came with me to college at least for a couple of years probably not my I know not my first year but um and I even remember um, when I finished not knowing how out, I can't not even be able to picture it any other way I sent away you can see here the magazine you know i cut out i sent away for this round frame that was on the cover and i know that i um brought it so this is the part that i do remember that little store that cross stitch store i brought it to the cross stitch store 
and ask them to frame it. And I know I used my babysitting money for that. Um, but I really loved the detail that you could see in her. And then the third of my babies. I mentioned I have three babies that hang on the wall. The tea party, the little girl with the duck. Um, so this was another issue of cross stitch and country craft. And this was the little baby that was taking a bath. And this one, I know that I was working on my freshman year of college. And there she is. And I know you're getting a reflection from the glass. Help you deal with that. Um, one story that will oh that will be a, a life lesson for me as a stitcher. And let's see if I can get it right. If you can look in this area right here, can you see the abrupt color change from the bottom rows to right about here? Yeah, you shouldn't see that abrupt color change. That is a DMC floss lot color change that I know I was using the same number, 648. 648, 648, they're both 648. And there was 648 left over for one of these other projects and then I ran out of that 648, so I bought another 648 and um, it was slightly different. You could see exactly where I started it. And so that was a lesson pretty early on in my stitching life that DMC, to me anyway, had different dye lots. Now I know there's always constantly conversation going on about this and even in the last few days there's been a lot of people uh, talking um, about buying DMC floss on Joanne's sale and the prices are going up so DMC floss is always a topic of conversation and whether or not there are different dye lots you can debate it all you like it all depends on your personal experience here's my experience people okay different dye lots right <laughs> granted this was a long time ago. This is um, hmm, 25 years ago. So, or hmm, not quite. Yeah. Oh gosh, yeah. Mm. So, whatever your experience is. But, um, yeah. I loved her face. Look how detailed her face is. So, my three babies that hang on the wall. You have now seen my three cross-stitch babies. So, I'm glad I had the opportunity to share those with you. Uh, the next thing to share. So, I was telling you about the colors, the blue and the choice to do the secondary color with brown. Um, so, the next piece I picked out to share, just sort of starting with some of the pieces that are hanging on my walls, um, totally in another realm of from cross-stitch is another counted canvas work design. Um, I don't know how many people watching this are familiar with the name Jean Hilton. She was a um, well-known at the time um, and prolific counted canvas work designer. She created a lot of the s unique stitches that are often used in some of the amazing uh, counted canvas designs that are found. I I'm trying to think, it was probably easily 10 years ago or so. One, once I learned about the world of blogs and how there were folks out there that would like share what they were stitching. Um, and I, I was thinking about this this morning. I cannot remember what blog it was. I, I think the person long ago stopped making a blog, but at the per there was a period of time, right around the time that I discovered blogs, I discovered this person's blog, and they were stitching a design called Scott Lee. And if I do this, you won't get a glare. And it's I, it's a terrible, you know, you're not even going to be able to tell very much. Okay. But what I thought was super cool was the really super up close pictures that this woman was sharing in her blog. And that's what intrigued me so much because seeing pictures like this, totally whatever, um, but seeing the unique stitches, which I hadn't really known before then. And what she was blogging was, you know, one day at a time, I'm working on this section and this section and 
just being able to see little bits of it, I was learning an awful lot. Now, the colors I thought were just awful. <laughs> and I thought that the whole design was awfully busy. Um, but it was intriguing to me. So I learned that Jean Hilton had passed away, that her designs were mostly out of print. And I also learned a valuable hint here that if you try to search Jean Hilton on eBay and you just type in Jean Hilton, yes, you'll probably find some of her stuff coming up, but you will also find results for Paris Hilton's jeans. So it's a great lesson when you're trying to teach people about the importance of search terms. <laughs> Um, so Jean Hilton designs would come up on eBay for outrageous amounts of money because the people who knew them and loved them were hoarding them <laughs> because she had passed away and they were out of print. Um, although you could randomly find various stores that would have this one or that one. A few years back, there was a store, there is a store called Stitches from the Heart and it's in Evansville, Indiana that um, purchased the copyright of her designs from her family, or at least some of them. And I don't know if it's an ongoing relationship because I think every so often they come out with another Jean Hilton design. And I think it was about 2010, 2011 that I saw somewhere posted that they had just released, the store had just released Scott Lee. And I remembered it was the one that I'd seen on that blog and I said, well, I have to get it. I don't know, how, I think I even sent an email or called the store and I said, how easy is it gonna to be to convert colors? And they acknowledged, well, there's no instructions to convert colors, you'd have to figure it out. And I'm like, I gotta get this design, whether or not I ever do it. And so I did, I got it, and it's quite a booklet, it's quite involved. But, the, oh, well, looky here, here's a bigger picture. You can see my notes, that might help you out a little bit. Um, I should have opened that up. But then what helped me so much was in the introduction to this, this is Jean's words, is that her design was inspired by a Persian rug and that her stepson loved Persian rugs and every area in her home is covered with rugs. And she stared at the family room rug for months before she realized she wanted to stitch in her interpretation of it. I don't know how much this is identical to her and rug, but that inspired me for my color scheme. I realized I want to do this, but now I have a source for what I want to do with colors. And so I used the rug that is down, that is um, under my table, my sort of all-purpose dining room kitchen, my, my eating area table, um, which I purposely looked hard for. I didn't need a fancy rug. I just wanted the right colors. And it's, its background is blue with lots of flowers and with a tan border, gray, well, excuse me, tan brownish border. And so from that, this became my interpretation of Jean Hilton Scott Lee. Now, I distinctly simplified, I'm gonna hold up that piece of paper that I found. I distinctly simplified some of the areas and I added in like this blue, simple, simple background, which she had left an empty space. Like I'm pleased with most of the simplifications that I made. Um, the color inspiration, the blue with the, the brownish color came from my rug. There's some highlights of green and pink. That's the highlights in my rug. Um, I realized when I was stitching that Ruby Razzle Dazzle piece that the blues and the browns are very similar shades to this piece, um, but that's just the way it is. So again, maybe it's very different from what a lot of you are used to doing from cross stitch, but I'm glad there was some interest in seeing some other stuff, so I wanted to share that with you. Next thing to share, I loved, and thank you so much for everyone who commented, um, when I, I said that I do a lot of lace work, bobbin lace is another passion of mine. Um, and the folks who said, sure, we'd be interested. I have what is my needlework bobbin lace combination project. Um, and I thought this would be a good one to share. For those who've never seen bobbin lace before, you will see bobbin lace and how it combines with needlework all in one here. Um, so I started doing bobbin lace. I, I've been doing lace for about 15 years. Um, which is built up in intensity and much more 
an important part of my life over the last few years. And um, lace books uh, and patterns can be very expensive, um, particularly because a lot of them come from Europe and so there's extra costs involved in when you're buying them here in the US. And a lot of them are not necessarily in English. <laughs> and there was a period of time where I was not at all going to buy any books that weren't in English. Um, my skills have gotten more so now that as long as the patterns and the visual parts of the book are good, I may not let language deter me, but kind of depends. This is a book that is in French. Dentille is the French word for lace. Torchon is um, the type of lace that many people start when they're first learning bobbin lace. There's Torchon, there's Box Point, there's uh, Bedfordshire, there's Honiton, there's all different kinds of lace to learn. Many people will start bobbin lace by learning Torchon. If you speak French, you might look at the word Torchon and say, that means dishcloth. And it does. And how the word Torchon in French also means the simplest kind of lace, I don't know. Anyway, this is a book in French. It's Torchon Lace. And Torchon lace is very um, geometric things. Uh, yeah, that's the best way to describe it. So like, here's a, ge here's a Torchon piece. That's just an edging. Here's a close up of the edging. This is a great book to show on Floss Tube because you could, it's got really good pictures. And some people say, well, when you're doing bobbin lace, what do you do with that? Sometimes it's just, you just do it because you love it. And sometimes, you, as you will see, you make something that you love so much that you put it in a frame. So this was a particular book that was an expensive book, um, but I saw one particular piece in here that just, I could not stop looking at. Do I have it centered enough? There you go. I just loved that. And... I knew that I could follow, you know, the bits, that's the extent of instructions. The diagrams were good enough for me. It was enough that I could do it. And I just love that. And even the moment that I saw this book, not only did I know it was going to be worth the money to get it, because I knew I would do it, it was also one that I could picture doing more than the lace. So. I worked on the bobbin lace and this was a piece that I've had framed so you can see the bobbin lace and it is um, basically sewn to a piece of fabric there and then framed but as I was working on this I also designed out some companion pieces and the companion pieces were created in different styles of needlework so this is black work. Everything is, um, these are all done basically straight stitches, although, yes, there's cross stitches in here, but you could argue that cross stitches are made with straight stitches. They're just diagonal straight stitches. You know, make your argument, whatever you want. This is identical in size, identical in proportion. It was done on 32 count linen. So to me, the challenge of doing the math of making it um, the identical proportions, that was just something I wanted to do. And I'm hoping you can see to the extent you may be interested in what the blackwork piece looks like. And also on 32 count, I wanted to make a piece. And here was an interesting, this was an interesting experience. The original plan for this one was hardanger. And the center area, the behind this piece, there's a black mat, or there might be a very, very dark gray, but so that you can see this. And this center area definitely has motifs of hardanger where I've cut out threads. I could not make that work for the other I had envisioned similar things going on in like these areas. I couldn't make it work and I say that sort of mathematically and from a needlework perspective 
I put this one aside and worked on the third one that I'll show you in a minute. And when I came back to it, I realized, well, it's going to be a combination of things. So there's hard hanger in the center. There's a lot of satin stitches here, satin stitches for the main um, lines here. And then it's a lot of pulled thread work. And pulled thread, this is on linen again, 32 count linen. And pulled thread is just when you're making stitches and you're pulling on the linen, so you're in effect creating holes. And again, because there's that black or dark gray mat, you're able to get a little bit of an effect of like a, a lacy effect to it. And then the third version I made to complement the lace um, is what I, it's a, a canvas work piece. This is done on 24 count Congress cloth. And Congress cloth is sort of halfway between a linen and, or Ada and a, a, a canvas in that it's not as soft as Ada or linen, but not as stiff as canvas. Um, and because it was 24 count, I had to redo the math, the graphing of it to make the proportions all fit. But I was trying to use some of the stitches, not the complex stitches of like that Jean Hilton piece, this is focusing enough. But I was trying to use some of the um, typical canvas work pieces that you would need a little bit more stiffness to your ground than you could typically do on a Ada or a linen. All four of these I had framed using the same frame. The four mats are all similar, but they're, they're variations of, of black, white, light gray and dark gray. Um, and all four hang together. Uh, I've shared these at a few different exhibits um, and just enjoy the opportunity to um, show that you could go in creative directions with whatever your inspiration is. That was a case where the lace inspired me to bring in the needlework world and there's times where it goes in reverse and I'll get a chance to talk about that other times. So. I've shared everything that I was hoping to share today in floss tube video number two. Um, I hope you've enjoyed seeing my little tour of a few new, a few other pieces. Um, thank you all so much if you've stuck with me to the end here. I really appreciate um, the kind words and and I've really appreciated being a part of this community. I will continue to watch and hopefully find some new friends among this group um, and appreciate everything. So thank you. Bye.